The story of St. Marcelin Champagne takes us back to the late 18th and early 19th century France. Marcelin walked its roads, cherished its terrain, respected the people who shaped him, suffered through the adversity that strengthened him, and in the end was seized by the God who was at the center of his life. Marcelin Champagne was born on May 20th, 1789. He was the second youngest of ten children. During the French Revolution, his father held public office in the town of Mars. Marcelin was born into a family where Christian values were put into daily practice. As a youth, Marcelin's life was quite normal. He grew up learning to farm, build, and attend school for a very brief time. His challenge with formal schoolwork, along with the brutal treatment that teachers meted out to students, worked against his settling in. Among his peers, he did not stand out as an exceptionally religious person. It came as a great surprise to his family when at the age of 15, he decided to enter the priesthood, hardly able to read. This deficiency was to be a cross for him to carry throughout his life. The initial years in the seminary were not easy, and after his first year, Marcelin was asked to leave. However, his mother encouraged him to continue, and with the help of the parish priest, he was readmitted. Early on, in the process of his formation as a priest, Marcelin became more open to the transforming grace of God in his life. The Lord used some very human means to focus the future saint's mind, heart, and energy on this one aim, loving Jesus and in turn, helping others to do the same. When Marcelin continued his seminary studies in Lyon, he joined a group of 12 seminarians who together promised to found a society dedicated to the Blessed Mother. On July 23, 1816, the 12 newly ordained priests went to Fourvier, a famous local shrine to the Blessed Mother, and formally pledged to found the Society of Mary. They intended it to include the whole world and have priests, brothers, sisters, and laypeople. Marcelin's dream was to organize a special group of brothers whose main work would be the Christian education of youth. He declared several times that it was the difficulties he had in school that caused him to conceive the project of preparing religious teaching brothers for country children. His studies now behind him, and at age 27, he arrived as a parish priest to serve the people of Lavala, a small parish consisting of a series of scattered hamlets in the foothills of Mount Pilat. His whole apostolic life was to be spent in this region of mountains and valleys, but his vision would reach far beyond Lavala. Mosslin also wanted to address the widespread lack of religious education and spiritual formation found in his day. He is quoted as saying, We must have brothers to teach catechism, to help the missionaries, and to conduct schools. Mosslin's dream was ambitious, to make Jesus known and loved among the young, particularly those who were most neglected. The founder was not simply concerned about providing better educational opportunities for young people, He wanted to help foster their religious development and experience of God's love. Marcelin was often heard to say, I cannot see a child without wanting to let him know how much Jesus Christ has loved him and how much he should in return love the divine Savior. The young priest also saw education as a means for integrating faith and culture. Champagne had more in mind than providing primary instruction for young people or even teaching them the truths of religion. He said, We aim at something better. We want to educate them, to instruct them in their duty, to teach them to practice it, to give them a Christian spirit and attitudes, and to form them to religious habits and the virtues possessed by a good Christian and a good citizen. A few months into his ministry, on October 28, 1816, Marcelin was called to the bedside of a dying teenager. Jean-Baptiste Montagne, who was ignorant of the most basic truths of the faith. Marcelin instructed him, heard his confession, and prepared him for death. He then left to visit another sick person in the area. When he returned to the Montagne household, the young priest learned that the youth had died. This experience transformed his heart.
Champagne then approached a young man of Lavala that he had met earlier, Jean-Marie Grandjean, and asked him if he wanted to become a teacher. Grandjean, who was 23 years old, said yes, and Marcelin borrowed money to buy a house in Lavala. He repaired it, cleaned it, built beds and a dining table. A second young man, Jean Baptiste Audre, who was 15 years old, joined Grandjean and they moved into the house on January 2nd, 1817. This date is regarded to be the foundation day of the Maris brothers. They worked together, prayed together, visited the sick and elderly, made nails to earn some money, and trained to be teachers. In May 1818, in Lavala, the first six brothers opened their first school. Marcel and Champagne loved young people. They, in turn, found his enthusiasm and energy contagious. Throughout the next few years, many others joined his band of brothers. The practice of the presence of God was more and more at the heart of Marcelin's spiritual life. His path to a deeper relationship with Jesus and Mary was not an easy one. The young priest encountered many rough stretches along the way. Marcelin and his brothers were poor. Brother Laurent, an early and faithful disciple of the founder, described the material circumstances of that initial community this way. We were very poor in the beginning, we had bread that was the color of the earth, but we always had what was necessary. Despite harsh conditions, the spirit of generosity and good humor that marked his first group of young recruits never failed to shine through. The early brothers did not have an easy life materially. The deprivation they suffered bound them one to another and caused them to share what little they had. It also kept them mindful of their need to live close to the circumstances of those they were called to serve. In February 1823, Marcelin learned that one of the brothers in another hamlet had come down with a serious illness. Concerned about his condition, the young priest set out on the 20-kilometer journey across rough countryside to visit him. Brother Stanislaus accompanied him. On their return, walking through heavily timbered territory, the two men were caught in the full fury of one of the region's snowstorms. Both were young and energetic, but hours of wandering lost on the slopes of Mount Palat led eventually to exhaustion. Stanislaus had reached the limits of his stamina. Night set in, the possibility of death in the snow increased with each passing hour. Both men turned to Mary for help and prayed the Memorare, a prayer which asked for Mary's help and reliance that she would help. Within a short while, they spied lamplight not too far away in the distance. A local farmer, Mr. Donay, had left his house to enter an attached stable. This particular evening, he had taken an unusual route, especially with the storm underway. By habit, he entered the stable through a convenient door in the wall of the house. For reasons that can be explained only by faith, this particular night he braved wind and snow and chose a route that took him outdoors with his lantern. For the rest of his days, Marcelin saw this deliverance and that of Brother Stanislaus, henceforth referred to as Memorare in the Snow, an act of providence. Whatever other reasons motivated the timing of his return journey, we can speculate that his sense of God's presence and confidence in the Blessed Mother and her protection caused him to undertake the trip where others might hesitate. 
Mosselin was, by this time in his life, aware of God's continual and powerful presence. Mary had also come through for him often enough that he counted on her protection without question. The memorare in the snow was simply an external manifestation of the much deeper spiritual reality of the man. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Rocheto, et spes nostra salve. When the revolution of 1830 broke out and soldiers invaded the brother's home, the Hermitage, Marcelin turned again to Mary, who came to his aid. In gratitude for keeping the brothers safe, the community decided to start each day with the Salve Regina, Hail Holy Queen, a practice retained by the brothers to this day. Throughout his life, the founder was fond of saying, to bring up children properly, we must love them, and love them all equally. The virtue of love, therefore, was not to be only the foundation of community, but also of a distinctive Maris method of evangelization and education. It had been Mary's way with Jesus. It was now to be the way of all who followed the dream that so captured the heart of this country priest and his early brothers. At the time of his death in 1840, at age 51, there were 280 Maris brothers working in 48 schools. When Marcelin Champagne completed his last will and testament, it included a summary of the spirituality of his little brothers. Practice the presence of God. It is the soul of prayer, meditation, and all the virtues. Let humility and simplicity be the characteristics that distinguish you from others. Maintain always a spirit of poverty and detachment. Have a filial and tender devotion to Mary. Love and be faithful to your vocation, and persevere in it courageously. Marcelin's dream lives on today in the lives of his brothers. Over 3,700 Maris brothers in 79 countries strive to continue Marcelin Champagne's legacy of strong family spirit in community and ministry, manual work, active concern for the marginalized and most neglected, deep faith in God, and a filial devotion to Mary, our good mother along with tens of thousands of others who share in the Maris spirit, the Maris brothers work to make Jesus Christ known and loved as they minister in schools, parishes, and other educational and youth settings. Marcelin Champagne was not a theologian, spiritual writer, or educational innovator, but he was an originator. There was no task too small nor too great for him to tackle, especially when the task was to serve his brothers and the people to whom he ministered. The world into which Marcelin Champagne was born in 1789 was beginning to convulse with the tremors of change. The one he left 51 years later had seen war and peace, prosperity and hardship, the death of one church and the birth of another. A man of his times, he carried within himself all the greatness and limitations of the people of his age. Suffering tempered him, setbacks strengthened him, Determination drove him, and grace helped him move beyond his circumstances. I beg of you, dear brothers, with all the affection of my soul, and by all the love you have for me, do all you can to ensure that charity is always maintained among you. 
Let it be said of the little brothers of Mary, as it was of the first Christians, see how they love one another. Thank you.